happy to be here. Um, so I'm not going to talk about how to build a VM, uh, and I'm also going to talk about, I usually use uh, a Java virtual machine, so that might be old-fashioned to some of you. No, no. Uh, but I'm going to talk about actually how do we use the language virtual machine, mine information from the memory manager, and optimize to improve performance, and then also energy efficiency, which is critical now. So that's what uh, that's where I'll start. So of course we have uh, the multi-core challenge now that uh, we have lots of processors on a chip. Uh, we have some memory here as well, but actually uh, the idea is everything needs to be parallel these days, uh, and that's that's definitely uh, a challenge. And so we have the layers on top of this, and of course we're going to talk about the managed language runtime environment here. So, and as I said, I'm going to I'm going to talk about the uh, Java virtual machine. So my idea is that uh, we need to get information from the managed language runtime environment down to the chip because, because we have the multi-core challenge now, we have to use these cores efficiently. And because now we're running into power limits as well, we need to minimize power. So I don't think hardware can mine enough information by itself, just getting an instruction stream and, and trying to save power. I think that the, the languages and actually the runtime environment, which is dynamically monitoring everything that's going on, how memory is used, the, the stream of instructions, uh, everything, so we can mine information from there and communicate information down to optimize for efficiency. So that's, that's the idea here. So some, some characteristics of managed languages, um, what they use garbage collection, right? So that's one of the benefits of managed languages. So I'm gonna give you, because a lot of my, my uh, research is, is how to use the information that a garbage collector has. So I'm gonna give you a, a brief background on generational garbage collection, um, which is a little bit different than what Richard talked about the other day. Although maybe you gave a background of, of garbage collection anyway, I don't know. But uh, so generational garbage collection goes with the idea of we first allocate brand new objects in a nursery. So objects get allocated in the nursery and eventually the nursery fills up. And in fact, the managed languages we found uh, have this characteristics that they allocate very rapidly, but then objects <coughs> die young. So not that many objects survive the nursery, so a lot of them are dead. They're just uh, temporary objects or, or objects that don't live a long time. So you trace the nursery, you say, okay, which ones are live? So you go tracing from the, the stacks and the globals and the set of statics from all of your program. You trace all of the things that uh, are reachable from that, and then everything else you say, that's garbage. I can collect it, I can reclaim it, I can use it again. So you trace for live objects, you copy just the live objects to the mature space. So the mature space just means it survived some amount of time. And, uh, and we can continue to use those objects. Uh, and then, of course, you reclaim the nursery and then you start all the fresh allocation again in the nursery. So that's the generational hypothesis. It's, we, we designed garbage collectors this way because, because uh, young objects die quickly and so we found that this is a very efficient way to collect garbage. Okay. So this is, this is how generational garbage collection works. So that's some background um, on, because that'll be useful for the rest of my talk. So okay, so going back to the, uh, the big picture of, of the system stack that we have today in the managed language runtime environment sitting in the, in the middle there, um, what are some of the challenges of managed language runtime environments, right? So what are the, some of the challenges that they introduce in our, in our system? So for example, uh, a lot of managed languages have zero initialization, so enforce zero initialization in the language, and Java is one of these, right? This is for memory safety, so everything's zeroed out before anybody uses anything. Um, and what we find is that, in fact, um, so a piece of memory is brought in, from, a piece of data is brought in from memory to the last level cache, um, and it's, it's zeroed out. So then it could be used for allocation by the, the application, right? But we found that uh, up to, this could be up to 45% of the traffic from memory just doing zeroing. Depending on the granularity of zeroing, you usually don't, don't uh, zero on an object level because that's quite inefficient. So you want to allocate, you want to uh, zero on a granularity maybe 32 kilobytes or something at a time. But in fact, this creates a lot of traffic here. Um, because maybe you, you zero, you first you have to bring in the, the uh, 
that, that chunk of memory, that chunk of data from memory, but in fact, you're just gonna write over what was there, so it doesn't really matter that it's being brought in. Um, and then sometimes, depending on, on the granularity of zeroing, sometimes this is kicked out before it's even used. So this leads to a cont contributing to the bandwidth problem, right? So this is a lot of memory being used. I told you um, that we use a lot of memory in, in managed languages. So, and then of course, bandwidth translates to power. So can consume a lot of power. So this is, this is a problem that uh, we would like to solve, right? Um, another thing with managed languages we found is that, as I mentioned with, uh, with, when talking about generational garbage collection, is that objects are allocated rapidly and they're short-lived. So a lot of them don't live very long. So that also fills up this last level cache uh, and then a lot of objects die. So this can contribute to the bandwidth problem as well if these are written back uh, because we actually, if they're dead, we, you're never going to read their information again because we've proven with the garbage collector that they're not reachable. So the application can no longer read their values because they're not reachable from anywhere. So this could also contribute to the bandwidth problem and then it's just cache pollution, right? A lot of objects are sitting around in cache and they're dead. So these are just some of the problems and I'll, I'll tell you about some of my research that's tackled these problems. Um, so, and, but the idea is there, there are challenges, right? There is an overhead somewhat to memory management, although that's been minimized over the years. Uh, but it also gives us an opportunity. So we know exactly how memory is being used. We can mine information about what data objects are being accessed together. We can change the layout dynamically with the managed language. So, uh, with the memory manager. So it also gives us all these opportunities for optimization. So I want to take advantage of that. Now, why do we need to optimize? Um, well, because we now need to think about ener energy efficiency computing. And we should not, nobody should ignore this because this is, this is a fact in today's, today's uh, chips. We can no longer just get uh, processors that are getting faster and faster for us, right? Now we have to paralyze our applications and we have to, uh, to think about power efficiency, energy efficiency, so, of course, we have data centers that are consuming huge kilowatt hours, huge amounts of, uh, of, ener of, of, of energy and, well, power, and, um, and of course, this equals money, right? So that, uh, that's true in the data center world, also with, of course, the mobile world. You're always worried about battery power, so uh, you actually want to make your, your programs as energy efficient as possible because the same applications now are running on your, on your smartphone as, or on the cloud even, right? They're running all over the place and they're all multi-threaded. I've heard about some, uh, some smartphones that have about 10, 10 cores on them nowadays. So they're, they're low power ARM chips, uh, but still. And then of course the end of denied scaling. So uh, all chips are power constrained. So we used to be able to always uh, lower the voltage uh, on the chips, but now we're, we hit power limits, we can no longer do that. There's also problems with extra leakage power. So we're just, the hardware's trying to deal with this as best they can, but my, my idea is that we need to have more communication between the, the layers of the system stack, from the higher levels to the lower levels, to actually inform the hardware how we want to use it, and maybe even help them save energy uh, by communicating across the stack. Okay, so, now we're worried about energy efficiency computing. So this is another visualization of the stack, but now we have a heterogeneous uh, chip down here. So we have big cores and little cores. So uh, who knows the difference between big and little cores? <laughs> okay, somebody tell me what's the difference in, in a big, really broad way. Yes? Big cores use low power. Yes, and how and why? Why do they use what? What makes them use a lot of power? What's the? I imagine they have like branch predictions and more execution units and stuff like that. That's true. One of the fundamental differences is that uh, the big cores run out of order execution, and the little cores run sometimes at a lower frequency, but also in order execution. So they're trying to exploit instruction level parallelism. They're trying to see if there's any independent instructions. We're going to try to issue them. Uh, as much as, as, as many at a time as we can, so to get some parallelism out of that. And then, um, of course, commit is done in order, but still we're trying to get things executed as fast as possible. But in that way, they use a lot of power. 
And these are more power efficient because they're executing instructions in order, so you don't have to worry about how many instructions are in flight at a time. The logic is simpler, right? Um, but the idea is that where we have this application and this virtual machine running on top of this, and there's application threads, right? There's also threads running in the virtual machine to do memory management and JIT compilation and profiling. Uh, and in fact, both of those, both the application and these days and the virtual machine are multi-threaded, right? They have their own threads running. So an open question is, how do we schedule these threads on, uh, on such a heterogeneous machine? So, one idea is, okay, well, it makes sense to put the virtual machine threads on the little cores because the application should be first priority. You think it, want, it should make progress all the time, and maybe the JIP compiler isn't running all the time. Maybe you know, the memory manager isn't collecting garbage all the time. So, but the, that's an open question, whether this, this schedule is, gets the best performance and has the, lower, has the best energy efficiency or not. So I'll talk about some work where we do some scheduling uh, on heterogeneous machines. Now let me go, uh, le so when we looked at scheduling on heterogeneous machines, we were working with a concurrent garbage collector. And I know Richard told you all about uh, his concurrent garbage collector the other day. So I'm going to visualize a concurrent garbage collector so you know what I'm going to talk about in the future. So here we have time on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we have a number of threads. So this is our co concurrent collector. It's not as, uh, as it does actually stop the world, as opposed to Richard's. Uh, it was written before, <laughs> before all of this, his research on this. But no, but that's not an important, not too important. So if we look at the application threads, this is a four-threaded application up here on the top. And the, the application threads progress for some amount of time. They allocate memory. At some point in time, they th hit a threshold we need to start a, a garbage collection cycle. Okay, so in our garbage collector, we actually have to, garbage collector, we have, to, we have to stop the application threads to identify a consistent set of routes. Okay, so that's not, uh, it's not mandatory that we do it this way, but this is how ours is designed. So we stop the application threads, we identify, uh, have a short pause, I identify a consistent set of the routes to trace from. I said we're tracing all of garbage, right? Just following pointers. Then the concurrent garbage collection threads, so these are set, visualized separately from the stop the world threads. So the stop the world threads are always when the application is not, no longer running. And then the concurrent threads, of course, run with the application. They're doing that tracing. They're looking at all the garbage. They're trying to identify garbage. And then in our collector, we have a small uh, pause when the concurrent collector is done. We again stop the application threads. And then we have a little cleanup phase that release the memory that was found to be garbage. And then we again start the application and it can consume all of that memory again. Okay, so what we find is that uh, the concurrent garbage collector cannot always keep up with application allocation. So what do I mean? I mean that if the concurrent collector is too slow, then the application is still, if you're having a multi-threaded application, and I said, uh, multi or managed languages uh, rapidly allocate, right? And now we have four threads rapidly allocating. So if the concurrent collector cannot keep up with that, cannot free up memory fast enough to satisfy the uh, allocation request of the application, then what happens is, well, the allocation request fails, so we actually just stop the application anyway. We have to finish, in a stop the world mode, we have to finish scanning memory, and then we free it up uh, and finally, we still release memory and the application can finally continue. But you'll notice that this is expensive. So if, if really, if the concurrent collector cannot keep up with allocation, we have, ex we have extra pausing here and the application is not running at all and cannot make progress. So this is bad. So keep that in mind. Uh, so this is what one uh, attribute we found that was important uh, that we need to pay attention to when we're doing scheduling on, uh, on heterogeneous multicores. So I'll talk about that work in a minute, but this is all kind of background to give you a flavor of what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna talk about also for the rest of the talk. Okay, so we wanted to look at, so here we have our concurrent collector. We wanted to look at the characteristics of this current collector and maybe the application as well 
when they run on big versus little cores. So I said, okay, we're we wanting to know where to schedule these threads. And we want to say, okay, what does it look like? What are, what's the differences when you schedule these threads, uh, application and concurrent garbage collector threads, on the big versus the little cores? So I'll give you a visualization of this. How many people know CPI stacks? Raise your hand. This is more uh, architectural. I'll teach you about CPI stacks, okay. No problem. So uh, CPI stacks are the, on the y-axis, we have benchmarks here, these are Decapo benchmarks, and the number means the number of application threads. Um, so these are single-threaded. Uh, the y-axis is cycles per instruction. So you have, you want cycles per instruction to be low, right? You want, um, you want like the number of cycles it takes to execute every single instruction to be low. So, and we have here a visualization. So each bar for each benchmark has a red part. That's the base component. And then the other components on the top of that, those are memory components. So the base component is the committed instructions, the useful work being able to be done. But sometimes instructions cannot be, cannot be committed. Why? Because you have to wait when you're going to memory, you have to wait, right? The memory request wasn't satisfied in the, in the L1 cache, maybe not in the L2 cache. You have to wait a little bit longer for the, L, the last level cache. And in the worst case, you go to memory and you spend a few hundreds of cycles waiting for memory. So this is what, so these are, these are useful instructions, committed instructions, and then these are waiting for the different components of memory. The L1 cache, uh, and then the, the purple is the L2 cache, and the L3 cache. Okay, these are all the application threads. And this is the average for the application threads, and then this is concurrent garbage collection. Just those threads. So we separate out the behavior of each of the threads. It's interesting that most of your L1 delays are on the instruction cache, not the data cache. Yeah, that's true. That is interesting. Yeah, it is from room for optimization right there. Yeah. But you notice that the for garbage collection, um, just when we're looking at, so this is running on the big core, these are all of these lines are on the big core, then I'll add the, when we run on the small core, we see the behavior change. But you'll notice that there's a huge memory component, L3 miss component, so that means it's going, the garbage collector has a lot of L3 misses, it's going to memory, and we're waiting for it a lot of the time. But you kind of expect that, because all we're doing is pointer chasing, uh, and we're actually tracing all of memory, so of course all of memory probably won't fit in the last level cache, which is the L3 cache here. So it has a much higher memory component than any of the applications, which you would kind of guess. Great, okay, so now we add the bars for the small cores. Now notice they all go up, which is to be expected because when you run on a small core, it takes longer, so you have more cycles per instruction. So the number of cycles per instruction goes up, not quite by two, but uh, it's running slower because it's more power efficient. So what else do we notice? Some of the components change, right? So we see here the uh, uh, several benchmarks have the L3 component grow larger, right? When they go, when you go to a to a uh, an in order core, so you're just waiting for uh, misses from memory, more a larger percentage of the time. What's interesting I want to point out is the concurrent garbage collector. So the base component of the concurrent garbage collector uh, doubled. So what does this mean? Does anybody have an idea of what that means? So notice the memory component didn't change, but the base component doubled. What that means is that the concurrent garbage collector can do uh, a lot more useful work uh, on the big core. So in fact, this means that it's, it's using the out of order execution properties of the big core to get instruction level parallelism. So in fact, it's, it was a surprise to us, but the, the big core action actually issue a lot of uh, instructions at the same time for, just, for the, just the garbage collector. Same with the application threads, you see actually the base component change a lot here. But we were surprised that there's so much uh, instruction level parallelism being exploited by the big core for the garbage collector. So that's interesting. 
So just some kind of interesting, okay, we're ana analyzing the problems, we're trying to think about optimizations, what are we getting here? Um, let me switch gears, uh, and another thing we did is looking at DVFS. So how many people know DVFS? Somebody tell me what DVFS stands for. <laughs> Dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. So that's also for, uh, for, for energy efficiency, right? So a lot of times now, each core, even maybe a big core and a small core, doesn't matter, or uh, which type of they, often cores can, can scale their frequency down to also be more energy efficient, right? So you could just run at a lower frequency and then you can, um, you can actually uh, save energy like that. Um, and you often sometimes have a performance uh, penalty for that, but still you're, you're getting, so we're talking about trade-offs, okay, do we want to improve performance or do we want to save energy? Sometimes we have to pay for that, right? Pay for saving energy uh, because power is really a first order concern these days. So if we think about scaling the frequency of applications or of garbage collector threads, it's okay. Um, if you, we're gonna look at, okay, if you increase the frequency uh, versus if you say, say, from the lowest, say from the lowest frequency, we're looking at a speed up. So if you increase the frequency, uh, would you expect your program to get, to get speed up or, or to not get speed up, let's say. Go higher, higher or lower than speed up? Higher, you would expect higher. So we found that if you have a memory bound program, changing the frequency doesn't really matter because that's the, the frequency with which uh, instructions are, ex are issued. But if it's memory bound, it's just t it's spending all of that time in the, in the top part of the bar just, go, just waiting for memory. So changing the frequency doesn't, doesn't change the speed up for memory bound. But of course, if they're compute bound, meaning they're just talking about is issuing instructions, there's not a lot of memory activity, then of course, yes, they, they improve speed up uh, when you increase the frequency. The, the thing is, it's not that black and white. Most programs are not just one or just the other, right? So there's a lot of applications in the middle. So the idea is we need to know when we change the frequency, what would happen to our performance? So if you're in the middle here, and sometimes there's phase behavior, right? So maybe you have a memory memory section, maybe you have like the compute section. You really want a, a good way to tell what's gonna happen to my program. If I'm, I'm trying to get an energy efficient execution out of my application, what's gonna happen uh, when I scale the frequency? So in fact, uh, you could sample you could sample at all of these DVFS states, so different frequencies, and then try to predict which one to go to next. So, okay, performance is like this at this frequency, performance is like this at this frequency, but then by the time you actually implement it, you might have had a phase change, right? So we actually are more for estimating the performance. So can you look at the application behavior and then estimate, predict, what it would be at a different frequency and whether we're predict whether we're memory bound or compute bound at this point in time, still it's, you have to pr predict and then, and then react. Um, but this gives you, this gives you a, faster, uh, a faster answer than sampling in all of the DVFS states. But we need an accurate predictor because otherwise you're not really going to save energy, right? You need to make sure that, okay, uh, this is memory bound so we could just run it at the lowest frequency but if, you, you, if you're wrong and it's compute bound, then you're really sacrificing performance. So we, we want the, you have to have an accurate uh, performance predictor to actually use DVFS in a, in a nice manner. Okay, so uh, we found that we were using, there's, there's existing performance predictors for how to use DVFS, but we found that there were none for multi-threaded uh, applications and none for managed languages, of course. Uh, architects are seem to be scared of managed languages in general. Um, and so we found that uh, about managed multi-threaded applications, there were things that there were diff diff properties that were different about these applications than, the, than the, the predictors had previously taken into account. So there's three things that we found that were different about these languages that we had to think about when we're talking about uh, using, creating a DVFS performance predictor. So heterogeneity, what do I mean by that? I mean that 
that difference between the application threads and the garbage collection threads or the service threads, the JIT comp compilation threads, they have different behavior. So there's inherent heterogeneity, even if the application threads all do the same thing, but because you're also running service threads all the time, they have different behavior. So that's heterogeneous. So they have different behavior to take into account. There's also a lot more synchronization. And we found that in, in native applications, and those written in C, that are not run on a managed language runtime environment, uh, there's a lot less synchronization activity, actually, than uh, in managed languages. Uh, and one of the reasons this may be is because we have these service threads as well. So there's actually synchronization between garbage collection threads. There's synchronization between garbage collection threads and application threads. There's also synchronization in the application threads. There's a lot of synchronization, and you have to take that into account when you're predicting, OK, we're running at this frequency now. What would happen if we halved the frequency? What would be the performance at that point? So you have to take these into account. The last thing which we found is interesting is store bursts. So previous predictors did not take these into account. Store bursts, what I mean by that is writes. Writes back to memory, bursts of ton, a ton of writes. And this actually can overwhelm the system because there's queues uh, that, that store all of the writes back to memory and they can fill up. And then it actually, it actually makes the, the processor not be able to do useful work and makes it just stall. So, and the reason there are more store bursts in, in managed languages is because of what I said just, bef just a few minutes ago, zero initialization. So we're doing a lot of writes of zeros, which of course C programs don't have, and um, also garbage collection. So it might be doing that copying of memory that I mentioned, so it's a lot doing a lot of writes as well there, um, and therefore that's also in a lot of stores, a lot of writes down to memory. Okay. So I talked about a lot of the problems, a lot of the ideas behind running managed language, lang managed language applications on top of multi-core heterogeneous hardware. And now I'm going to talk about uh, how do we actually optimize for efficiency. So, but before I do that, so I have three different works that if I have time, I'll touch, <laughs> touch on that uh, we did for, to optimize here. But before I do that, uh, I want to talk about uh, the, um, the, how do I say, the evaluation setup, right? So with all of these, if I'm talking about performance, I'm talking about energy efficiency, I need a good way, I need a good system stack, I need a good way to measure things. And so in order to evaluate these, of course you need, in our case, a simulator. So uh, it was very, so as I said, the computer architects don't really like managed languages because it's very difficult to simulate managed languages and it's, simulators are just, Slow, 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 right? So simulators run th maybe 300 times as slow as, as just running your program on your desktop. Sorry, on your smartphone, nobody has desktops. Um, so, so we had a, a sniper simulator, which is a cycle level, but uh, not cycle accurate, uh, for x86 parallel high speed simulator. So it can simulate multicores, it can simulate heterogeneous, which came in handy for us. Uh, different frequencies, can estimate power, um, and we had to extend it to work with a JVM. So there were some tricky bits, um, has to work with a JIT compiler, so it has to be work with code being overwritten uh, and changing, and it has to, uh, had to emulate system calls. So we have Futex and Nanosleep, these kind of things, the simulator had to emulate them, and then we had to do some communication. So the idea, I, I told you we need to communicate information from higher levels to lower levels, so we had to add in some way to communicate from the higher levels to the lower levels. So we added that. So this is Sniper Simulator, you can take a look at it, and if you want to run, this is, this is running with, uh, this is on the next slide, uh, Jikes, so the Jikes Research Virtual Machine. Uh, so we got this running on top of Sniper, so you can do your own simulations and test out your own hypothetical architectures with this. Um, so all of the experiments I'm going to show you are with the uh, Jikes uh, 3.1.2 and the Apple benchmarks. We use various collectors, both the uh, generational best, product, best, best uh, production compilers, the generational IMIX one, and then the concurrent mark sweep snapshot at the beginning algorithm. Uh, we usually use two times minimum heap and we do replay compilation and measure the second invocation. Okay. So now we have an idea of, of the setup, how do we actually measure, if we actually optimize anything or not. 
So now I'll dive into the details of three different works that actually use all of this framework that actually try to improve performance and save energy. Okay, so the first is cooperative cache scrubbing. So this work was published at PACT uh, two years ago. So we look at our stack again, our pretty picture. Uh, and I told you already that problem with the allocation wall. So we rapidly allocate objects and then they're dead, right? They're collected. And this also, as I mentioned, translates into the bandwidth wall because a lot of these tend to be written back to memory, even though we know they're dead and they will not be written again. So, in fact, they might be used for a future allocation in that they might be brought back in to be zero initialized, right? Because they have to be written because nobody can see their data ever again. So, of course, zero initialization is that bringing in chunks of, big chunks of memory and zeroing it. Okay, so we already know this. We looked at this before. So the idea behind cooperative cache scrubbing is to use this. So we communicate from the managed language runtime environment to say, look, wait, garbage collector knows which data is dead. Why don't we just tell the caches, hey, all of this data is dead. Get rid of it in your cache. Don't write it back. Save bandwidth. And we can communicate and say, hey, look, we're zeroing this, we're writing all of it. We don't care what it was before. Don't actually fetch it from memory. We're just gonna zero, just instantiate it in cache and write to it directly and, and save the read bandwidth reading that in because we don't care what it was anyway. So the idea is we do cooperative cache scrubbing to save both write uh, bandwidth here for the deadlines being written back and read bandwidth for those being brought in to be zero. Okay, so remember our picture of generational garbage collection? So we had the nursery being reclaimed and it's being ready for fresh allocation. At that exact moment, we communicate this information down to the last level cache in our simulator, which is eight megabytes in this case, and we say, okay, just, just as an as a idea of how much can we, can we expect to save on this, we say, at this moment, we've communicated, all of this information is dead, how much of the, of the last level cache actually does contain dead data at this particular point in time. So we did this study just to see, okay, is there room for improvement? So we see that with different nursery sizes, four megabytes, eight megabytes, and 16 megabytes, we have our benchmarks. This is the average fraction of the last level cache that contains deadlines immediately after a nursery collection. So we see that the percentages are high, are above 50%. Uh, so, of course, for a four megabyte nursery with an eight megabyte a last level cache, around 50% makes sense. Um, and then for the eight megabyte and 16 megabyte caches, or nursery sizes, sorry, we go up. So there's a huge amount of dead data sitting in our last level cache. So that's just cache pollution. Okay, great. So there's opportunity. So if we communicate that, we can save a lot of, of, uh, of cache pollution, right? And hopefully that rate bandwidth. Another question is, okay, now that we have this dead data in the last level cache, because we have a simulator, we can collect statistics, how much is actually written back, so how many of the lines that are written back to memory from the last level cache actually contain only dead data? So how much wasted bandwidth are, do we have? Just write bandwidth. So just to identify the opportunity, we have different nursery sizes here. This is the, let me get it right, the fraction of all lines written to DRAM to mem back to memory that exclusively contain dead objects. So they're useless. So with a four megabyte nursery, it's pretty low, but you see when the nursery size matches the last level cache size, it goes up to, I think that's 60%. So a large fraction of, uh, of write backs back to memory are useless. So there is great opportunity to, do, to save bandwidth, which translates into power savings, uh, energy savings. So the idea behind cooperative cache scrubbing is to communicate this semantic information to hardware, and the caches then scrub the cache lines that are dead, that we say, okay, these are dead, just scrub them, get rid of them, so you can bring in more useful information. And we communicate the lines that will be zeroed, so that we say, okay, this, these lines are gonna be zeroed, so don't bring in anything from memory, just zero them directly in cache. So we attack writes, both write and read traffic with these. Um, and of course, this is better cache management, so we're, we're only putting hopefully useful data in cache. Uh, we avoid traffic to DRAM and then we save DRAM energy. 
Okay, so on the software side, this is cooperative hardware, software hard, hardware, right? Okay? On the software side, we identify cache line aligned uh, regions that are being either, that are either dead or being zeroed. And using the generational IMAX collector, uh, after each nursery collection, we communicate the, the, the lines that are dead and we call scrub, scrub a, a, new, a new instruction that we created, a scrub instruction uh, down to the cache to say, just get rid of this in the cache. And then the zeroing instructions, uh, we say, uh, we do on a 32 kilobyte granularity, we, we tell the cache, okay, this is going to be zeroed, so don't bring in the, mem the, the chunk from memory, the chunk of, of the range of data from memory, uh, just instantiate it in cache and zero it directly and save the read traffic. On the hardware side, we had to make some changes, so I won't talk about the different instructions that we uh, tried. We tried different instructions in the, in, the la in the last level cache to actually do these scrubbing, so invalidation or clearing the dirty bit. Uh, so the invalidation is very similar to PowerPC's DCBI, but I think that this was uh, con discontinued many years ago. Uh, so we're gonna, I'm going to focus on CL Clean because it was the best performing in our, in, in our um, evaluation. And then, of course, zeroing, which is also similar to an old PowerPC uh, DCBZ instruction, but never, it was never on Intel architectures. Um, but it's privileged, so I think it's only the, only the operating system can uh, and do it. It can be called from the user level. So okay, so we, we evaluate also CL0. And then this required changes to the cache coherence protocol, which I won't go into because this is an architecture focused course. Um, so as I mentioned, we use the Sniper simulator um, and we use MCPAT to measure power. Uh, and we use the IMIX collector and we have four application threads here and four garbage collection threads in all our, our experiments. So of course, I, I will show you some results. Of course, we were attacking, as I said, right traffic with the CL, we, we call it CL clean. Well, all of the first three instructions, those are the scrubbing instructions. They attack right traffic, CL zero attacks read traffic. And so combined, this is total DRAM traffic saved uh, or reduction. And then so what, what we, if we combine CL clean and CL zero, that means that we're saving both write and read. So that should always be the highest bar, right? So in depending on the nursery size, these are the nursery sizes here, we see that uh, we can save huge amounts. So I think this is about 40%, this is 75%, and this is about 62%. We can save, with both optimizations together, we can save a huge amount of DRAM traffic. So that's great. And that's why we focus on, I, I'm telling you about CL Clean because these, these saw, this is just write traffic and this is basically just read traffic. So uh, we, uh, so I'm focusing on CL Clean just because that's the best performing. Yeah. Why is the CL invalidated is so negative? This one, because, uh, so invalidate, it, it, it removes a line completely from cache. And so in, with a four megabyte, nursery and an eight megabyte cache, it would, it, the line would completely reside in cache if we just left it alone. But by invalidating it, we have to bring it in completely again. And so it's kicking out useful, it's kicking out a line from cache that doesn't really need to be kicked out. And so, because the four megabyte nursery would completely reside in cache normally, so it's actually actually adding traffic. So it's, it's requiring the fetch again for it later. Is that your question? Yeah. I know that the Decapo benchmarks don't have a huge working set, um, but I don't. Yeah, I don't remember exactly. But it's true that so one thing is this is reduced because the 16 megabyte nursery, the LLC we fixed it at eight megabytes. So if the nursery is bigger than the LLC, then data will always be be already being th thrown out before we can actually scrub it. So some of the dead data is already written back. We can't. You have to. You have to be timely with your scrubs. So, um, so I don't know if I can say for absolute certainty that the working set is less, but uh, it's possible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned that the hardware already doing its own optimizations to figure out what the program is doing or how it could like downscale the voltage or something like that. Yeah. 
Is that reflected in what? In your emulator. In your simulator. Simulator. Uh, yes, I mean, yes, it's modeling modern hardware. So, like 22 nanometer Intel Nehalem type machines. So, um, it has branch predictors. It has all of the the yeah the general the architecture that uh, that x86 is has in general in the Intel machines. Okay, so that you said should translate one to one. Hopefully, yes. There's always some in, in error in simulators. So it's around 20% with our simulator. Uh, but yes, in general, you should see similar savings on a real machine. If, if, that instruction, if these instructions that we propose would be implemented on a real machine. Yeah. Okay. So uh, if we look at total DRAM energy this saves, this is also great. So, of course, uh, for seal clean plus seal zero together, we save 20%. Um, and here it's just a little less, but still, still uh, saving large amounts of DRAM energy, which is what we wanted it, energy efficiency, right? So that's great. Uh, and dynamic, dynamic DRAM energy is, is huge. It's more like 70%. In fact, uh, so just for seal clean and seal zero without the other options, uh, just these together. So you notice that, so this is DRAM reads and DRAM writes um, that can be saved with uh, these different nursery sizes uh, and traffic together is those two combines. Last level misses is also very huge because um, it's, it's basically similar to DRAM reads. But the execution time, if you notice I didn't, I didn't highlight that because the execution time reduction is low. It's about five, six percent. Uh, the reason is because modern modern machines uh, try to get as much MLP memory level parallelism as they want, so they try to hide the memory latency. So we're saving we're saving a lot of traffic, yes, but they hide the latency, and so therefore it doesn't directly translate into execution time. It does save execution time, but it's not the main advantage. Uh, and then dynamic DRAM energy is great, and then total DRAM energy we also saw, so we save all of these things. Yeah, we found the eight megabyte nursery is best. So, in fact, like this, if you're using this technique, it would could guide what what uh, what you set your nursery to because it would it would be most beneficial. But it, it, of course, if the last level cache size changed, you might have to re. So, how many calls were you simulating? About four. four. So you would have eight level, eight megabyte last level cache. Yep. About two megabytes. Yes. So what are the other bars on these um, on this bar chart if you have twenty percent accurate in the simulator? Yes, that's what that's what you get with the simulator. So uh, it's very hard to model hardware in super amounts of detail already. The simulator. So to these these benchmarks took uh, just seconds to run natively on on a machine, and then it took about one to three days to run each benchmark on the simulator uh, to get to get these results. So, so there's already there's it's difficult first of all to know exactly the details of everything that's implemented in an Intel. Um, Do you have a, a ballpark figure of what the maximum error is on, on these numbers? These numbers, no. I can tell you that the, the simulator itself was validated against real hardware, and they got around twenty percent error. But that's that's true with all simulator. Uh, studies, so that's implicit. But because we're proposing new instructions, we couldn't, we couldn't use this on the real machine that exists. So, yes. Is this um, bomb allocation? In this uh, yes, with the generational <coughs> in the nursery, you just bump allocate. Do you prefetch ahead of the bomb allocation? Uh, with this, I don't think we had the prefetcher on. Because I did this in Spark back in what, what, for two, uh, Niagara 2. Yeah. And um, got similar DRAM bandwidth settings, yeah. but there's no improvement in performance because the prefetcher was prefetching all the, uh, okay. all the junk yeah. in, in a timely manner. Yeah, that so might that be. Isn't that what the execution time small bars say? 
Yeah, we, I got zero. Okay. It wasn't. It wasn't ten percent. It was zero. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so there was some related work. Some people also did this, uh, tried to do this with uh, C, so Izan and John back in 2009. Uh, but they had to add a lot of hardware to actually, because they were using, using C, so they didn't have the object granularity, and they had to monitor this all themselves. Um, so they required a large map and hardware and extra cache bits, so our instructions are much lighter weight than that. Um, and then some work by a, a colleague of mine and me back uh, more than a decade ago, we had also with C and Fortran static analysis to give cache hints to evict or keep data. Uh, and then uh, uh, Yang et al., which is I'm also on this paper, studied zero initialization uh, and just, just the costs of zero initialization and the traffic that it causes. But they actually uh, increased bandwidth with their with their solution to just write directly to DRAM and not and avoid the caches entirely. Okay, so this is cooperative cache scrubbing. Um, so we uh, we communicate from the higher levels to the lower levels, um, and we build the simulation infrastructure to to so it could actually the, the Java virtual machine could run on top of it, um, and of course we see uh, benefits to traffic and DRAM energy. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears and actually go to a different uh, PowerPoint presentation. Just because it was uh, done at a different time. Okay, so now I'm going to switch gears and go to, um, go to heterogeneous machines. So that was just a multi-core. So uh, now I'm going to go see how we scheduled that collection on, a, on heterogeneous multi-cores. Okay. And this is where published in just earlier this year in Taco with my colleagues at Kent University. So, okay, so we have this little uh, picture again. We have our application threads in blue, and we have our virtual machine service threads like garbage collector, JIT comp compiler, th things in green. And previous work actually suggested just what I said to schedule the application threads on the big cores because they always need more, uh, they always need to be progressing, that we always want to give them the higher power cores, whereas the service side should go on the little cores because they don't need, uh, they, they should be memory bound, and they don't need, uh, they don't, aren't running all the time. So that was the previous idea of how do we schedule uh, managed manage language applications and service threads on heterogeneous machines. But as I told you, we found that the current collector cannot always keep up with allocation, especially in a multi-threaded context, because there's just a lot of allocation going on. And so the concurrent collector uh, basically sometimes has to stop the world because it just can't collect garbage fast enough. And then, uh, and that actually delays the application progress even more. So we want to avoid this. We want to avoid it stopping the world uh, and, and not being able to keep up with collection. So we wanted to see we wanted to see how much this happens really in practice with our benchmarks. So we wanted to test we call it GC criticality. So when does actually GC become critical, aka when can it not keep up and has to stop the application entirely? So to do this, we scheduled all of the the application on the big cores, and if the stop the world garbage collection threads are running, always on big cores because they're running by themselves. So might as well use the big core to improve performance. Then we, we changed the concurrent collector and we ran it first on the little core, little cores, and then on the big cores, and then we wanted to see the performance difference just between changing the cores that the concurrent collector ran on and everything else stays constant. And we have one core per thread, so we're not worried about under-provisioning or something like this. Okay. So to see that the, this is the increase in execution time for our benchmarks on uh, running the, the, just the concurrent collector on little versus big. And we find there's two categories of benchmarks, right? The ones on the left, we call them GC uncritical, and the ones on the right, we call them GC critical because there's a huge performance difference, well, it can be huge, not always huge, but a, a noticeable performance difference between running on the little core versus the big core. So that means these are the ones that in fact 
the, when the, the concurrent collector cannot keep up with allocation, it has to stop the world, and that's what increases execution time. So these are the ones that the con concurrent collector really benefits from running on that big core, because you can see a difference, uh, a large difference in total execution time when you run on that little core. And these, in notice, these are mostly the single-threaded benchmarks. Some of the, the um, in fact, Sunflow is more compute-bound. So these, these benchmarks uh, don't see a lot of GC criticality, so it doesn't matter. They can go on the little core. There's not a big performance difference if the, the GC runs on the little core here. Might as well save power, right? But these, uh, you notice they're the more of the multi-threaded, going up to four application threads. So these uh, are actually do have GC criticality, right? So our scheduler, we notice this uh, fact, and so we built a scheduler to take advantage of this. So we measure this GC criticality during runtime. So we measure when there's that, that stop the world pause in the middle of concurrent collection. We then communicate this down to the scheduler, and in our case the scheduler's in the simulator, but in a normal machine it would be in the operating system, right? And then, uh, and then we, we change the, the scheduler so normally the application threads are on big and the GC threads are on little. Uh, and we give some big cores to the garbage collector and we move the application down to the little core. So this has two effects. Notice that the application thread goes on little so it's slowed down. But all of this rapid allocation that the, that the application was doing um, that, that the GC couldn't be kept up with, well now it's slowed down. So allocation should scale back a little bit, which is kind of what we need, because we need the garbage collector to keep up with allocation so it doesn't stop the application entirely. So we give them big cord cycles, excuse me, so it has a bit more, uh, so the, it has a bit more horsepower behind the garbage collector so it can try to keep up. Okay, so that's the idea behind the scheduler. Uh, so let me show you some details, how we use the scheduler. So we, the baseline was, was that GC on small. Always put the garbage collector on the, on the small core, on the little core. Um, we also experimented with the GC fair, which gets, it's just a round robin scheduler. All threads get equal time on the big core. doesn't matter if you're out application or, or garbage collector. Um, Okay, so let me see, show you how this scheduler works. So we have the application running, and then there's some garbage collection pauses, and then the application's running, and, and, and so forth. We, take, we have a sampling interval. So it's a fixed amount of time, and during the sampling interval, we pay attention, and we see if we've seen any of these scan pauses. So this, this stopping the application when, when usually the concurrent collector should have been able to do the... the um, do the collection without stopping the world. So whether, whether we see a scan pause or not, that's when we, we detect that GC criticality. If we see GC criticality, we switch from this GC on small scheduler to we call it GC boost, which means giving the GC some cycles on the big core. And we go by this scheme. So how many milliseconds are you scheduled on the big core? So we, we continually boost up so we're going, first it's one millisecond to the first GC thread, and the second GC thread one millisecond, and then we give more, and so the next one would be two also to this one. So we, we're continually giving more, more uh, scheduling cycles um, to the garbage collector on the big core if we continually see this, this GC criticality signal, right? If we don't see it, we go back and we, we decrease the number of, of uh, of OS scheduling quantums that the, the garbage collector gets on the big core. So we, we give it back to small core for, for energy efficiency sake, right? So we give more cycles back to the application on the big core. If at some point we see we have this, this uh, IMAX, it's an interval, an interval counter. If for some number of intervals we see that there's no, there's no GC criticality signal, then we go back to the GC on small scheduler. So give all of the big core back to the application. We don't need those cycles anymore because we're not seeing GC criticality. Okay, so the sampling interval is variable. So the scheduling quantum is usually fixed by the operating system, but the sampling interval, how, how long we, we detect whether there's 
adjacent criticality signal from, from the JVM, um, we can vary that. So we vary that in our experiments. So here's our experimental setup. We use the concurrent collector in JIKES in this one. Um, we vary the number of, of th threads in the, for the DeCapo benchmarks. And then uh, the big core is out of order that we're simulating, so heterogeneous. The small core is in order. And we use a three-level cache hierarchy, and we vary a bunch of things. So I'll just show you experiments for, yeah. Um, so uh, both the big and the small core, do they share the L1 cache? Uh, no. L1 is specific to per core. Yeah. So, so how will this So they share, they share the last level cache. But I think the L1 and L2 would be separate. Okay. Would be separate per core. Yeah. Okay. And do you keep, sorry, do you keep the number of GC threads fixed? Yes. It's always two. Why? We found that uh, in, in work with Jikes, just specific to Jikes, we found that it doesn't scale above two. Even for, so two is the optimal even for single threaded benchmarks in Jikes. For some reason we found performance goes down if you go up to, even, so normally the convention is like, okay, four application threads, four GC threads. No, we found that was not, not, as, not as well performing in Jikes. It doesn't scale that well, so we found that two GC threads, uh, and that's published in the bottle graphs work in Oops, uh, forget what year, 2013, 14, something like that. So that's why uh, you use that. Okay. So uh, I'll show 3B1S, meaning three big cores and one small core, so four cores total. Uh, we did, there's, a, I'll show you the paper reference so you can look at the paper later if you are interested. But uh, I'll show results for just the three big cores, one small core. But we also did two big cores, two small cores, and one big core, three small cores. Um, and the baseline is always keeping the GC always on the little core. Uh, and uh, yeah, we vary the sampling interval and this IMAX is the number of intervals you have to see before going back to the GC on small scheduler. Okay, so some results. Here's our benchmarks, again, the number of threads, if it's applicable here. Um, and then we get the percentage of execution time reduction when we use our scheduler. So we've divided this up into the, the GC uncritical on the left, as I showed in that other graph, and the critical on the right. And you notice that we have the GC fair. So that was just a round robin schedule that gives every thread equal amount of time on the big core. Um, and then we have our adaptive scheduler using different parameters for the, the, um, the, schedule, the sampling interval and for that IMAX. Uh, but on average, they do, they do very similar, actually, small differences. But we found that on the GC uncritical, uh, GC fair can actually do really, really poorly, can actually uh, make execution time in, uh, degrade quite a bit. Um, and so, but because we're reacting to GC criticality, our, our scheduler does not suffer in the same way. So we're basically neutral for GC uncritical benchmarks, so those that never see, never see that, that, uh, that, uh, critical, that critical scan phase, so never see a time when the concurrent collector cannot keep up with allocation. Uh, for those, of course, that, uh, that are GC critical, so the, the, the concurrent collector cannot always keep up with allocation, we see uh, quite a bit benefit between, uh, I think on average, around 15, 16% improvement. So also GC FAIR sees improvements here. The, just the advantage we have over GC FAIR is that uh, it can be detrimental to performance if you don't need, if the GC never needs cycles on the big core, we don't want a round robin schedule that's giving big core cycles to the GC because then that takes, that takes cycles away from the application. So we want the application to have the big core if it's not necessary for the GC. Uh, and notice again that, of course, these are the multi-threaded benchmarks, so they have more GC criticality. So if we go to higher threads, usually, because there's just more allocation, more threads, more allocation going on, you are more likely to see GC criticality. Okay, now I said, oh yeah. Did you, did you 
you uh, calculated the impact of monitoring uh, GEC, um, the need of GC for for big or for small and commuting the GC from small core to big core? Ah, uh, yeah, that's very. That's just. Uh, uh, yeah, a context switch. That that's not very expensive just to to do scheduling. It's the same if there's a. A critical section in your in your uh, application, and, and the thread has to be scheduled out because it's no longer running or it's waiting on a critical section or something. So that's like could be memory effects. But sorry, yes. On the graph, you have the GC fair in red, and yes, it has more of more execution time reduction. So this is lower is low below zero is bad. This is this is good. I mean, higher than zero is good. Is better. When you, when you compare GC fair to adaptive, yes. uh, uh, GC fair seems to, to be better reduction. It gives on average it gives a little bit less. Uh, or no, ah. on average it gives well. Here it's the same as one of our adaptive with particular parameters. <coughs> and on the total average, it's it's worse. Saying when the problem is GC fair, it's you use the big core to open the GC, so you have the less for the application. Yes. Uh, but is it like, is it for the concurrent GC it's taking that? Or is it because if it's a stored over GC, I mean, anyway, the application <coughs> won't run. So in that case, I guess it wouldn't matter. It's a, well, we're running the concurrent collector. Yeah, it's for the concurrent, of course. Yeah, yeah if, the, if the application stopped, we put the, the stop the world threads on, on the big core because we're, yeah, we're trying to maximize performance anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Given that you'd expect GC not to take a lot of execution time, you're getting a substantial reduction. That's yeah, with this, with the, the schedule. But this is the concurrent collector, so it's running for actually quite a significant fraction, yeah. or a more significant fraction than the stop of the world, right? Sure. Okay, so let me show you because I said we're optimizing for inter for efficiency and not just for improvement uh, uh, performance. Sorry, also energy efficiency. So this is the uh, same results per percent reduction in EDP. Uh, EDP means the energy uh, energy delay product. So it's the energy consumed times the execution time. So that means that if the time it takes for your whole uh, execution to run is shorter then EDP will get better. Even if you're using, so you notice we're only using four cores. So we're using all of the cores almost all of the time, especially in the multi-threaded benchmarks. And so we're not, we're not actually, we're, we're winning on energy just by lowering the execution time, not by actually running everything at lower power, on the lower power cores, right? We're using all the cores. So, but we do win in, in EDP, especially for, of course, the critical <coughs> benchmarks here. It's a 20% improvement in, in EDP. So we're saving energy efficiency. Just because we're, we're, the applications are running for a short amount of time because we have a better scheduler, more efficiently using the big and the small cores. And of course, for, for the uncritical, it's minor, it's it's more it's generally neutral, but here's I think the average is like minus point something, minus one. Okay. Yeah. Is that energy of the CPU or CPU in memory system or like? That's just the CPU, I believe. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. So all of the results I showed you so far are with the. The big and the little being run at the same frequency. These are results when, so that's the, the what I've been showing you before is the red bars. So the small core at 2.6 gigahertz, which is what the big core is also at. If we reduce this, the little core to 1.6 gigahertz, so it's it's a bit more realistic that, that the, the little core also runs at a lower frequency, then we see even better uh, performance improvements. So some of the the applications here that were not GC critical, in fact, became GC critical, 
meaning they have a, a difference in execution time here with our scheduler. And then here we see that higher benefits, uh, improved execution when the actual small core is running at a low, lower frequency, just meaning that we have to use that resource in a, in a more intelligent way and transfer to the big core if we need it because the big core is gonna be a lot, a lot more, uh, uh, a lot more, how do I say, it will get be a lot better performance than a small core running at a lower frequency. Okay. So here's my conclusions. Uh, so the concurrent collector does benefit from outer border execution. So in fact, it does benefit from running on a big core. Uh, and multi-threaded uh, applications, especially when you increase the uh, application thread count, do have GC criticality. So because of excessive allocation in the application threads. So we have a scheduler that dynamically gives that garbage collector more, t more time on the big core based on these signals, so communication across the stack from the JVM down to the scheduler, uh, which improves both performance and energy efficiency. Okay, so I'm gonna touch on this third work, but I don't really have time to go into the details. So I'll just give you a flavor of it. But I wanna mention it because it's also interesting. This is not scheduling and not communicating to memory. This is performance prediction for DVFS. So how do we, if we scale the frequency down like this, would we see a performance uh, penalty or not? Can we afford to save this amount of energy uh, if, we, if we only slow the application down by a couple percent? So, and this was, was, uh, was at this pass just last month, wait, no, April. No, that's two months ago. Um, so I'll give you a, a very high level of what this is about and then we'll, I'll take questions. Um, let's get through that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, okay, so the idea is that I mentioned the, some characteristics that make it hard to predict performance when you're scaling the frequency of a core and this is more difficult with multi-threaded managed language uh, applications. And what makes it difficult is, so we have application threads here and garbage collection threads here and time going along on the x-axis. What makes it difficult is we have these um, synchronization points. So we have times when the garbage collector is running but the application is not, right? And so there's, there has to be inherent synchronization to say from the application to the garbage collector saying, wake up now, you have to do something. And then the garbage collector runs and then and the application is stopped. So in this case, we're using a stop the road collector. Um, and then the garbage collection. So of course, that's what I said, that, that there's been no predictors for, first of all, multi-threaded and definitely not managed languages. So they never ha these predictors never had to take into account the, the uh, independence, the interdependence between the application thread and then and waking up the garbage collection thread at a certain point and then the garbage collection thread running and then uh, waking up the application thread again. And then of course there's there's a there's the the uh, synchronization within application threads. So there's a lot of synchronization we found in in managed language applications also between between the service threads and the application. So this was also a difficulty in predicting performance. So we actually have to take it synchronization into account when you're predicting performance because you want to see basically uh, if you run this at a different frequency, then the critical section could take less amount of time, could and because this will wake up another thread when it's done, this is waiting, so this thread will wake up that guy when it's done with this, the uh, critical section, for example. Uh, you have to take these, these interdependencies into account because that could shift if you run this at a different frequency, right? Um, and so you, and you have to think about, okay, w the memory, the memory part that's, that's, uh, that's not gonna, if you're, if you're memory bound, you're not gonna change with frequency, but if you're compute bound, it will change a lot. The performance will change a lot with frequency. And then of course, these last thing is uh, store bursts. So bursts of stores at the end of a collection, I told you, we have zero, zero initialization, so we have a bunch of, of writes down, of zeros down to the memory, 
And in fact, this is also a problem when we're doing performance prediction. So we have a, 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 a DVFS performance predictor, which we call DEP, takes inter-thread inter dependencies, DEP, into account, and then burst, takes store bursts into account. So, uh, DEP plus burst, a new DVFS performance predictor. So previous performance predictors did not take in inter-thread dependencies into account, all of the synchronization, didn't know about garbage collection threads, uh, and then didn't know about store bursts. So these are all characteristics of managed languages, which didn't, you don't really need uh, to take into account for native applications. So, okay, so I'll skip over results. I just wanted to give you an idea of, of what we had to do to do performance prediction in managed languages. Um, so of course we had to take into account this heterogeneity, service threads, garbage collection threads, JIT compiler threads, synchronization, a lot more synchronization than, than native applications, and then burst of stores because of garbage collector and zero initialization. So I won't show you results because I don't have time, but we do save both, uh, we save energy. Uh, this, this, of course, if you, if you lower the frequency, you can save energy, but you do see a performance degradation. So we try to minimize the performance degradation and maximize the energy uh, savings. So that's what we're doing here. So we take these three uh, things about managed languages into account for to do performance prediction uh, for DVFS in order to save energy. We have high accuracy, uh, low overhead, and then of course energy saving. So okay, uh, if you're interested, these are the three main works I talked about. Uh, cooperative cache scrubbing, boosting the priority of garbage, and scheduling uh, on heterogeneous multicores, and then this last one, DVFS performance prediction for managed multi-threaded applications. <laughs> so this is all about communicating across the system stack in order to optimize, still try to get performance improvements, but save energy because that's really critical on modern hardware. Okay, thank you. I'll take questions.